Thank you to everybody for coming to our panel here on, uh, on bugs and uh, all sorts of creepy crawly things. Um, I, I personally, maybe I'm biased, uh, but I think we have uh, the most interesting people here at SunFest right here in this room right now sitting at that table. So I'm, I'm really excited to be uh, talking with all of them and uh, here to, uh, here to um, learn some things about, uh, we're talking mosquitoes especially, and about West Nile virus. So uh, my name is John Ingold. I'm the healthcare reporter at the Colorado Sun. Um, so I cover all things uh, infectious disease, health policy, health insurance, uh, really just the gamut. I also uh, every week do a, an email newsletter that goes out to premium members of the Sun um, called The Temperature. It covers both health and climate. So I write that with my colleague Michael Booth and uh, we have a lot of fun with it while also um, spreading a lot of uh, new information that, that we're learning about uh, the intersection of health and climate and uh, the ways maybe they don't relate to. So, um, so I want to introduce our speakers here really quickly. Uh, first of all, we have Bob Hancock sitting right there in the blue polo shirt. Bob is the mosquito man himself. He is a biology professor here at Metro State. Um, he's a filmmaker. Uh, if you want to be creeped out, go to mosquitomanfilms.com. <laughs> way, way, way scarier than any Halloween movie you're going to see is the bed bug film that he did. Uh, do not watch it before you go to sleep. Do not. <laughs> do not. But it's pretty hilarious. Next to Bob is Anna Wanak, who is the uh, surveillance director. I have it here. Director of surveillance at uh, Ve Vector Disease Control International, which is a company that uh, monitors mosquito populations to uh, try to make sure that we are ahead of the game when it comes to controlling West Nile virus. And to her left is Doc Weissman, who is an entomologist, a longtime Colorado bug expert extraordinaire, frequent um, um, uh, media source. Certainly, you've, you've been interviewed hundreds of times, thousands of times. I, I, I lost track. Yeah. And uh, Bob is the, or, sorry, Doc is the uh, chief entomologist at VDCI, uh, in addition to a whole bunch of other things. So uh, I mentioned today we're talking West Nile virus and mosquitoes. The, these two are, of course, interrelated because West Nile virus is a disease that is spread by mosquitoes uh, and uh, can be very serious in humans. Uh, it's, it's a disease that um, if you are bitten by a, an infected mosquito, and we can talk more about the specific kinds of mosquitoes uh, and, and how they behave, but if you're bitten by an infected mosquito uh, and you are yourself you're infected, 80% of people don't actually show symptoms, so it's kind of one of these sneaky viruses. Um, but about uh, one in 150 will have what is known as a neuroinvasive case, which could be very, very serious. It um, causes uh, all sorts of neurological damage. People can take uh, a long time just to relearn how to walk. I know we have a friend of the sun who caught West Nile and had a neuroinvasive case, very active individual, and uh, is still in the recovery process now, uh, one or two years later. And uh, in rare cases, it can cause death. So. Uh, this year in Colorado, we are seeing um, the worst West Nile season that we have seen, I think you can probably say that on total, since 2003, which is when the virus really first exploded here in Colorado. It's not native, it sort of first popped up in 2002, and um, 2003 was what would be known as the epidemic year. After that, it sort of settled into this regular sort of thing, and then the last few years, we've really seen a big increase. As of this morning, uh, more than 500 people, 543 people, have been diagnosed with a case of West Nile. 332 have been hospitalized. 279 have had neuroinvasive cases, and there's been 31 deaths, which is the most since 2003. And um, these numbers have really been going up in recent years, and uh, a few months ago, I wanted to know why and that sent me on a path to Bob's door. <laughs> so um, I, I thought maybe we could get into just kind of talking about what West Nile is, and Bob has some videos that he wants to show. So let's roll uh, video number one right now. Sunfest, I have the unique challenge to present to you the essence of West Nile virus in Colorado in a very short period of time. That way we can discuss it. So here we're gonna look at the basic cycle. I think we know this. Mosquitoes to birds to mosquitoes to birds. Um, there's more to it than just that, however, because mosquitoes can also 
transmitted to humans and horses and their kin. So we're going to add some things to our diagram to kind of help us understand this. I'm going to put little dots here. Every little dot is kind of a representation of lots and lots of virus. So I'm putting most of my, most of my dots up here. Same thing would happen down here. Basically, every one of these organisms, every one of these organisms has to acquire a virus and grow the virus and give the virus. So I call that the three G's, excuse me. I call that the three G's. And the three G's would be to get it, to grow it, and to give it. And of course, that's always involving a mosquito bite. And then we'll start again. The mosquito ultimately has to get it the mosquito has to grow it, and the mosquito has to give it. Let's make sure that we get some virus dots here, and we'll have a lot of dots as we get close to the time. So, uh, we can take one, any one of these animals and represent the thing graphically, and I think that's the most important thing to do right now. So let's take the bird. So that is the curve of the progression of virus in a bird. Um, the reason it goes down, of course, is the immune system of the bird kicks in, uh, and that's just kind of how it is. Um, notice that the span here is kind of less than a week for birds. They get it really fast. They get sick quickly. I want to use something else. I'm going to draw with a pink marker here a threshold. And I'm going to write the word threshold and I'm going to crosshatch this part. This is the only time frame that this bird has enough virus to give, to give it to a mosquito. So I could actually draw a line from right here. This give right here from bird to mosquito comes from the mosquito feeding on a bird only when it has a high viremia. I want to shift to another screen here, to another part of my whiteboard. Okay, so here we are. Um, the mosquito vectors, a little bit more information on this. We've got two predominant vectors in the state of Colorado, Culex tarsalis, this is the number one vector, and Culex pipiens. I'm actually going to take my pink marker and I'm going to circle Culex tarsalis. The reason I'm going to do that is that these are the ones that, uh, that are surveilled. Whoops, let's get an eye in there. These are the ones where we actually collect these and send them to the state lab or other labs and get a kind of a positive or negative on whether a pool of mosquitoes of this type has West Nile. I think what we want to do is identify that, of course, the mosquito vectors can get it, the mosquito vectors can grow it, the mosquito vectors can give it. Of course, it requires time, as was indicated over here. The reservoir hosts, birds, especially passerine birds, the, the, the perching birds, these guys can clearly get it, these guys can clearly grow it, some of them get sick, some of them get deathly ill, crows and jays, for instance. And, of course, the ones that survive, especially a lot of these perching birds, can give it. They can develop enough virus to reach that threshold that we talked about over there. Then we have, for humans and equids, we can certainly get it, we can certainly grow it, but not like our, our, our feathered friends. We grow it on them, we don't grow as much of it, but it makes us hellaciously sick. And here's the most important part for right now, big red X. We are what we call dead end hosts, we cannot give it, horses cannot give it, and that's the big picture. So over here, we had one week, seven days, kind of the bird cycle is within that. The human cycle is fairly similar to this. So let's draw the human cycle. We had established a viremic threshold in birds, and in humans and equids, nowhere near that. 
uh, that, that curve of virus, nowhere near enough virus, and that's why we are dead end hosts. One more thing, and this could be the most important. We have to find out what these guys do when they get it. Okay, this mosquito picks it up from a bird, a viremic bird, and not really a lot is happening in terms of measurable virus, and then it kind of goes like this. One of the cool things, too, is that mosquitoes, well, it's not cool for the epidemiology, but mosquitoes, once they have it, they have it for life. Uh, what really is the big deal here in the mosquitoes is that it seems to be all about survival. And then, of course, what things influence survival? The number one thing in influencing survival is moisture and temperature. There it is. That's the big story. The whole big picture. <laughs> that was hard to get in that time frame. So this is fun. I, I hadn't actually even seen any of these videos, so I was, I was trusting you to, uh, to make them entertaining. Well, <laughs> so are we. <laughs> my buddy Justin's back there. Justin is uh, my, he's both my student and my TA at Metro, and he helped me with this. Uh, he was my kind of, like, uh, that's not good, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bob, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is the Culex mosquito. Um, it doesn't favor feeding on humans, right? It, it typically wants to feed on birds. And um, I've heard it described as like a West Nile virus case occurs, then a human being sort of stumbles into this transmission cycle that uh, is already going on in nature. So these cycles are mostly occurring in specific types of environments, specific habitats. I wonder if you can talk more about what that is for a Culex mosquito. Well, yeah, the bird thing is a real great question. Uh, we, we have so many new tools to figure out what mosquitoes are feeding on, and for a long time they would just kind of say, okay, this is an ornithophilic mosquito feeding on birds. Um, and I, I think a lot of recent research is showing that Culex mosquitoes, especially Culex tar salis, uh, do predominantly feed on birds, but they've got all these great molecular tools, like these little fingerprints that they can take. Whenever they find a mosquito in nature with a blood meal in it, uh, you can find out what that blood meal is now. And they're finding out that they're feeding on a wide variety of other animals, but we're still seeing predominantly bird meals. And it, it absolutely, that one mosquito to be a vector has to do both. It has to feed on a bird. That's the only place it's gonna get enough virus, as you can see. And then it ultimately has to survive this period of time and feed on a human or a horse or who knows what, or ever, ever else, but that whole cycle, they've got to feed on two different kinds of animals. And, and if I could just add to that, yeah. uh, he, he put up two species up there, Culex tarsalis and Culex pipiens. Culex pipiens uh, feeds almost exclusively on birds. Very rarely will it go after humans. And it's the more dominant vector out east. Mm -hmm. And they don't have as many human cases of West Nile out east, in part because Culex pipiens is more common than Culex tarsalis. Once you get to the Mississippi River, Culex tarsalis starts dominating, and that one will bite birds or people. In fact, a study done in Weld County a few years back showed that seasonally that'll change. Mm -hmm. They'll bite more birds early on in the season, start switching to mammals later on. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a great point, and it's something I forgot to mention in the intro, which is that Colorado is the national hotspot right now for West Nile virus. You would think like, oh, we're not that buggy here in Colorado. Mosquitoes aren't that bad in Colorado. Well, we have, I checked the CDC numbers today. They, they lag a little bit behind, but we have three times as many West Nile cases this year as the second closest state, which is California. Mm -hmm. So you start extrapolating on a per capita basis mm -hmm. and we're way above everybody else, way above Texas, <laughs> way above Florida, way above any place where you would think would be a lot buggier. Colorado is in fact the West Nile hotspot which makes this a real public health issue here for us in Colorado. And that's when we get to Anna's work and some of the surveillance that you do. So uh, I know we have a, a video on this, but I thought maybe we could just start by um, telling us what it is that uh, you do to, to monitor West Nile and um, what do you hope to find out? 
Um, yeah, so um, my lab, um, I hire seasonals every year that um, go out and learn how to uh, set mosquito traps and identify uh, mosquitoes to species. Um, we, we take those mosquitoes back to my lab and um, sort out the uh, tarsalis, um, and then those are sent to the um, Colorado Department of Health and Environment for testing. Um, there's a few small contracts where I also uh, do ramp testing uh, for mosquitoes as well. And how do you know what a tarsalis looks like? Um, <laughs> I can picture it perfectly in my head, in fact. Um, <laughs> Um, they have a white band on their nose. Um, they have a curved butt versus a pointy one. Um, there's a lot of little characteristics. Mosquito butts, people. Yeah. You didn't oh yeah, I spend it. all day looking at butts. It, yeah. It, it, <laughs> Culex tarsalis is the sexiest Culex mosquito I've ever seen. Most of them are very boring. The quality They're very beautiful. The, yeah. the sexiest Culex mosquito yeah. you've yeah. ever yeah. seen. Not the sexiest mosquito. Oh no, yeah. of course not. Yeah. <laughs> They're surprisingly pretty under a microscope. Okay, I, I will trust you on that one. <laughs> um, do we want to play video number two here? This is it. This site will forever be in Colorado infamy, especially with the people that are controlling mosquitoes and that are involved in public health. Why? This thing right here this is industry standard equipment for surveilling mosquitoes almost all over the world, but definitely right here. It's called a CDC CO2 baited light trap. So let me show you some of the features of this thing. It's pretty awesome. So starting up at the top, we have here a cooler with CO2. Of course, what's CO2? It's dry ice, it's in there. And if I blow like this, check it out, now it's going. So that is dry ice sublimating, producing CO2 gas, and it comes around over this lid. CO2 is heavier, and it's, it's colder. It's going down, and then there's a fan and a light, more on the light in a minute. The fan is spinning, it's pulling CO2 through, and notice there's a mesh bag and a, a hard plastic container with a screen lid on the bottom. So we have this big thing where CO2 is coming around and then being deployed out through this fan, and there's a light. So, the CO2 definitely fires up the mosquitoes. Female mosquitoes that are flying at dusk and then into the evening are cruising around. They're picking up this odor. They're flying to it. The light brings them in. You know, they're excited with the chemical. The light brings them in and they fly towards the light. And once they get right up here in this area, they're in the vortex, they're in the suction. <laughs> And they're down here in the trap. And there are mosquitoes in this trap. I'm gonna turn on my little light right here so you can see what I'm talking about. So if you see right here in the silhouette, there are a lot of mosquitoes in there already. And even better, if we turn it this way, look at that. Look at those mosquitoes right there. Can you see that? <laughs> There's a whole bunch of mosquitoes in there. That should be about it. Okay. Uh, Eric, you can quit that one. I better. <laughs> so, Anna, what were you finding in these traps this year? <laughs> what were the results of the surveillance this year? Um, there's around six to 12 species that we commonly see in the traps, including uh, Culex tarsalis amphibians. Um, and so we learn, you know, we do identify all of those, but uh, mostly we're looking for tarsalis, right, um, for testing. 
Um, and depending on the trap, this is in Fort Lupton, this one um, can come back very, very Culex heavy. <laughs> um, it's around a lot of um, standing water sources, which are fantastic for breeding Culex. So I, I know if people have seen some of the national stories about uh, like malaria making a comeback around the world. There's, yeah. there's a lot of mosquitoes that can be disease vectors, but we don't necessarily see all those in Colorado. So what, other than the Culex, do we see any, any that are disease vectors for humans? Um, not really. Actually, Colorado is great because we don't have to worry about things like Zika and dengue and um, malaria. The pathogen itself can't really survive here. Um, we technically have mosquitoes that could carry uh, malaria, but uh, it's such a dry climate. Malaria doesn't do very well in dry climates. It's more of a, um, you know, humidity, uh, needs humidity in order to survive. Okay. Well, so that's good news. <coughs> you know, it's interesting that you use this Fort Lupton site, just to add a little historical perspective. Yeah. Um, that's the site where we first found the Asian tiger mosquito in Colorado, and it was across a canal from a giant tire storage site. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly how they came here. The tire storage site is gone. There's no tiger mosquitoes in Fort Lupton anymore. Mm -hmm. But that historically was where this disease vector, the Asian tiger mosquito could carry yellow fever, could carry dengue, could carry Zika, but it never got established here in Colorado. It's just too dry. Mm -hmm. Well, Doc, let's jump in on that. Um, I know when I had been talking with Bob earlier and we talked about kind of the history of bugs here in Colorado and he mentioned uh, like university uh, library collections, university museum collections rather, um, that have like bug specimens going all the way back to, um, you know, Anglo settlement. And primarily it was grasshoppers for a long time, like a lot of grasshoppers. They, they made the press. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now we're starting to see really big mosquito populations and like what's driving that? We're not a we're not a buggy place, so why are we getting you dangerous probably, bugs? You probably had your eyes open when you came to the building today, uh, and you noticed that uh, it doesn't look like it did 150 years ago. You're too young to remember this, but 150 <laughs> years ago, this was a short grass prairie. I think you are too, but <laughs> no, 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 I remember. no, 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 he's not. No, well. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> aside, actually, you are too. 100, 150 <laughs> years ago, uh, this was short grass prairie. There were no trees to speak of. There was very little water. There was very little nectar. And for blood meals, there weren't many humans either. Uh, so the four things that mosquitoes need to survive are water, because most of their life cycle is in the water, the eggs, the larvae, the pupae, all in the water. They need nectar. That's their main food source. Only the females get blood. They need the protein to lay eggs. So the females and the males both go after nectar for the fuel. But, but you know, if your only nutrition comes from Mountain Dew, you know, <laughs> You're not going to be able to survive very long. <laughs> Certainly not going to have enough protein to lay eggs. So the females have to get that blood meal to get the protein to lay their eggs. Actually, I've survived pretty long on that. Anyway, um, and then uh, here in Colorado, it's, it's hot. You, th you think of mosquitoes kind of like vi vampires in some ways. If they're out in the sun, they're going to die. Well, 150 years ago, it was all sun. There were very few places to hide from the sun. There were no trees in Denver. There were, there were very few trees along the riverways. Um, and so the mosquitoes wouldn't live long enough to get a virus like West Nile built up in their system. They would just die before that happened. So if I would have been here 150 years ago, I wouldn't have had a summer job because there just wasn't enough in the way of mosquitoes. Yeah. You get a burst in the springtime yeah. when the snow melts come and then it dry up. And you get a burst during the monsoons, it dry up again. And so mosquitoes weren't an issue 150 years ago. We've created the perfect habitat for them. We grow trees everywhere. We've got shade everywhere. We've got water everywhere. Uh, not just these detention ponds and retention ponds you see around town, but also irrigation. We use a lot of water with irrigation, and that creates pools of water where mosquitoes can breed. Uh, and you know, even the Smurf swimming pool in the backyard, if you don't dump it out once in a while, you know, when the grandkids are done playing in, in it, you're gonna get mosquitoes in there too. So we've created the perfect habitat for them. Yeah, and I think we have a video on this one too, Eric, number oh, cool. three. Oh, good. Yep. <laughs> this is a quart field on the lowlands, and this is a really thirsty plant. So they irrigate it by running water down the corn rows, and there's always too much water. And now, of course, it floods over into the borrow ditch, and it's created an optimum wetland, an unintentional wetland. So look at this, cattails, Moss, water, lots of emergent vegetation. What does this mean? Culex tarsalis breeding site. Got the dipper. 
Just a couple of good dips. Oh yeah, look at right there. Right off the bat, there's two Culex tarsalis larvae right there. So as you can see, this is one of the major ways in which irrigation unintentionally produces incredible mosquito habitat. Come get you some corn dog grass. <laughs> another just like that just keep dipping and dipping we all live in a stinky cattail marsh a stinky cattail marsh a stinky cattail marsh we all live in a stinky cattail marsh a stinky cattail marsh a stinky cattail marsh <laughs> This. this is my treasure. My treasure is extraordinary. Look at all those guys. Look at this thing. Larvae and pupae. You think they look good here? Wait till you see them under high magnification. They completely rock. What's with the frantically batting antennae, arms? What is that? Oh yeah, so the 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 the, 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 the they're filter feeders. So, so these these insects um, are feeding on organic material, and they have very highly modified mouth parts. And the things that you saw flickering, they're called lateral palatal brushes, but they're basically these very nice comb comb-like arrays of hairs. And they both they do two things with this. They generate current with it, and they even catch particles. And the whole thing is producing a vortex, and they're cramming this food into their mouths. And then um, they continue to do this pretty much 24/7, digesting food, constantly pooping out of the other end. And uh, they it's it's remarkable because they're in a hurry. Culex mosquitoes very often have to complete this process you know, within six or seven days, and then uh, kind of get out, especially if it's in a place where water could be drying out, right? So, Anna, I was wondering for you, when you're doing your surveillance work, um, what are the traps, or what, what are they next to that are picking up the most mosquitoes? Where, where are you seeing this pattern really play out mostly, especially in, in kind of the place where people are living, sort of in the, the metro area? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, somewhere like Denver, um, where you have a lot of, uh, you know, retention areas um, that are near uh, human habitation, we see a lot of um, pipians in, in Denver, and there's a lot of, like, you know, birds and humans interacting very, very closely. Um, and so Denver is um, actually one of the places that we test pipians as well as tarsalis. Um, because we're going to find large numbers of them there, and we also have higher potential for them to clash with humans. Um, Weld County, though, for example, um, you see way more tarsalis out there, um, and they're, you know, in these areas that are being irrigated that are, um, you know, like Hancock said, may not be filled for very long, and so they're breeding very, very quickly in these small standing water areas. And that, was, that video was in Weld. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think a lot of times when you see West Nile cases, sometimes you see them in agricultural areas in Colorado. So I think Weld, I think uh, Eastern Larimer, Eastern Boulder County. We, we've seen a lot of West Nile cases this year just in Denver, mm -hmm. which, you know, I'm a Denver resident. I can get kind of complacent and thinking like, oh, the mosquitoes in my backyard that are in my kiddie pool mm -hmm. are not, um, they're, they're not going to hurt me. They're, they're not like the disease vector mosquitoes, but that's actually, that's not the case. So from a, a public health standpoint, it's a good thing to remember, like when you're going to be around a place where there's mosquitoes, long sleeves, long pants, bug spray, 
that has like DEET in it, according to uh, the CDC, they would tell you that. Um, I know sometimes I try to use like the herbal organic stuff and it doesn't always work as well. Um, so just in terms of like a, a, a public health precaution thing, it's just, it's worth remembering that a mosquito bite can be dangerous and the mosquitoes that can get you can get you anywhere. It doesn't, you don't have to be standing beside uh, an irrigation canal in a, a cornfield. So Bob, I wanted to, to turn real quick to you um, and I wanted to ask about climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of thought about how this is going to change um, obviously the temperature, the summertime temps in Colorado, uh, how it'll change uh, precipitation patterns. Uh, but I know when we spoke before, you weren't entirely convinced it was going to change the mosquito pattern. So maybe you could explain that. Well, I mean, my partner in crime, Doc, over here, has been doing it in the state here longer than I have. And he hasn't really seen a change. This year, I saw a change. And um, that, that change was evident because so many of my students work, Anne is a former student, and she employs so many of my former students. Doc and I have been recruiting Metro students since I got here in 2008. Um, and anyway, um, the, I, I was, I, I, my, my number one student couldn't even make it into my lab in Metro this summer to take care of his mosquito colonies for research, which are the black and white 80s ones that Doc was talking about, because he was working time and a half, overtime, so much. And the reason he was doing that, record year for sure, in terms of the numbers of traps that they call, what do you call them, Anna, when they're maxed out? You just can't, there are too many to count and separate. Gross. <laughs> no, I've seen, I've seen photographs from their lab, but I think Doc sent me one about four years ago, and you know, it's, it's, it's a pile of mosquitoes next to a soda can, and the pile of mosquitoes is just as tall as a soda can, I think it was a coffee mug, but coffee <laughs> anyway, mug, yeah. and, and it, it, you know, it, it just, it, that's from one of those traps that I showed you. One night, one capacity. trap. Yeah. Yeah. So 35,000 mosquitoes in one night, one trap. Mm -hmm. That means that they're pushing against each other to try to get past that fan. Mm -hmm. There's so many mosquitoes in yeah. the air that time. Yeah. It, it, it's, yeah. it's insane. So, so when we talked, John, I, I, I did, you know, I was thinking that the reason that uh, climate change will, will not be impacting us, I'm certainly one that, 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 knows, that sees the data, and I know that climate is changing, but you look at our water habits and what we do with our water, and that most of our water and most of our mosquito breeding is due to our activities. And those activities are not likely to change unless we get really into the dark side of climate change and we don't have enough water to fill our reservoirs. Um, we often don't in drought. We come out of that this year. But uh, I'm, I'm, I now know just from, from one year that weather can really, really make a difference. Now, what that, whether that has anything to do with climate change, I don't know. But I can say with confidence that um, the data that Anna and I looked up for, um, we're giving a talk in Spain in a month poor us. Um, Can I come? Well, I guess poor me. Uh, anyway, but, but, and my wife Diane. <laughs> but, uh, but, but in, and Anna will be giving that talk actually in, in, in uh, February, but we were, um, uh, we, we were looking at uh, kind of precipitation and trying to relate precipitation to mosquito abundance in our traps. And it was uh, striking the amount of precipitation this year we had in May and June. Mm -hmm. Three and four times, and in many, many parts of the state, um, historical records, mm -hmm. way back since they started recording these data in the 1800s. And we're seeing more of that kind of thing. And I don't know if it's just a blip on the radar and then it comes back and we go to drought again or, or what, but mosquitoes need water and we've got a lot of it. This year. This year. Yeah, if we could predict the future, we'd be down at the track making real money. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be entomologists, but, but we, can, we can look at the present, we can look at the past, and we can know what's going on now. And by the beginning of July, we reached our average precipitation for the year. Yeah. Now, in a state where most of the mosquitoes come from irrigation, how this is significant is it filled up every reservoir. Yeah. Anyone who had water rights was able to use their water rights yeah. this year. 
And so irrigation caused mosquito issues were, were huge this year. There's nobody who didn't have the rights to use their water. And in, in the way the water rights are set up, if you don't use them, you lose them. And so people were flooding crops that they didn't necessarily have to because there was enough rain on these crops already. And we were seeing water bodies fill with water from that rain to levels that they hadn't been to before. Now, that doesn't affect the Culex as much as it affects the nuisance mosquitoes. There were eggs along the shore of these streams and these ponds, around the, the, the habitat, that hadn't hatched in years. These, some of these eggs can last for years unhatched. And the water level filled high enough to flood them, warm enough, and there were, we had unprecedented numbers of these nuisance mosquitoes because uh, those eggs got to hatch this year. And with the females that laid eggs this year were above the water line, so those eggs might not hatch until we get flooded like that again. So these weather years, these crazy weather years, can have a huge impact. I haven't seen a weather year like this since 1995. And that delayed the opening of the butterfly pavilion by six weeks. So, you know, that's the kind of rain we had this year. Mm -hmm. To reach our average by the beginning of July. If you look at yesterday, uh, we're already at 18.12 inches. <laughs> Normally, this time of year, we'd be at 12 inches, not, not 18. So we're way above, we might hit a record. 1973 was 23 inches of precipitation. Are, are we going to hit 1973? Well, if, if we get enough snow between now and December 31st, we might have a new record for precipitation this year. So could this year's effects on water storage and water use end up rippling into the coming years yes. for, for mosquito populations? The reservoirs are filled. If they remain filled through the winter, next spring anyone with water rights is going to be able to use them regardless of whether we get spring rains or not regardless of whether we get a huge snowpack or not the reservoirs are filled and yeah. so irrigation is going to happen next year so the irrigation factory john and when, when we talked i called it the mosquito factory we made a mosquito factory but the other piece that's so important here is that we have a, a lot of mosquitoes that are alive now now what's happening now is we're going to go into winter Culex mosquitoes overwinter as adult females. They go into culverts, rodent burrows, mines. One of the original discoveries of Culex tarsalis overwintering was by a CDC scientist from Fort Collins. They were in a mine shaft. Back in the you know, middle of the 20th century, that discovery was made. And if those mosquitoes that are going in there can actually overwinter. We know we're, we know that we're going to send a lot of them into that winter diapause because of how many that we have, and how good that our you know temperature, moisture. We've had these conditions, so there's probably a lot more going in, and there could be a lot more coming out. So uh, I want to shift here to how we control these mosquito populations. Um, and Anna, I thought maybe you can give us an overview of how it works now. What, what's sort of the, the standard control methods? Yeah, so um, about 90% of control is done um, in the water on larvae. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, what we use is a um, bacteria called um, BTI. It's got a very long name, but I won't subject you to that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's very, very target specific to mosquito larvae and black fly larvae. And so that way we can use that, um, tackle the majority of the population without harming fish, frogs, things like that. Um, and then on top of that, we do use uh, less target specific supplemental control, such as uh, adult side spraying, um, as well as uh, there's forms of pupil control as well that we use. Are there uh, environmental hazards that go along with spraying, environmental risks? Well, it's a lot different than it was back when they were just spraying DDT all over your friends and family. Um, <laughs> you know, um, so the I will say the pesticide is designed for the safety of the person that's a, uh, apl applying it, um, and so it's very very safe. Um, of course. You know, like anything, you can overdose on water if you have too much water, right? So like anything, if you're exposed to a high dosage, um, that can become problematic. But as far as what we're doing, it's, it's very little um, of health concern, um, the spraying itself. But the spraying gets all the press. 
Yeah. It's less well, than 5% of modern mosquito control. It definitely but it, brings it's very visible, attention. right? And people get concerned yes. about it because right. of that. You don't yeah. usually see the kid with the dipper kid, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere yeah. my yeah. age, but you don't usually see the technician with the dipper going through the swamp and applying the bacterial larvicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but you do see the trucks when, when that's needed. Mm -hmm. So, Bob, let's talk about um, newer ideas for how to control mosquito populations, which is sort of this like Trojan horse system? Maybe you can explain it? Yeah. Or, or well, do you want to run the video first? Uh, you know, I think we should run the video. This video okay. is going to be, I'm going to pre preface this though. I had two camera women on this trip, actually three. Diane was with me too, and she's a camera woman, so I had three. And she's, she writes my theme song, so I got that covered too. Uh, but anyway, uh, Anna was one of those. And here we are in Rio de Janeiro. So here, we have some pots with water, and then we need to drain them. Once we have uh, all the pupae, we feed them with uh, sugar, sure. uh, sugar solution. Because yeah. we need to be like well fed, rest, happy, with the best conditions in the room, so they have the same opportunity to find the females and mate with them. You know, we're not just about releasing males; it's releasing healthy males. They're gonna do all the they have to do. You know, finding females mating with them and passing the strain gene to the offspring so the offspring will die. So this is like a literal mosquito so factory. male, female literal breeding but this this mosquito population factory, the largest mosquito problem. factory in history. And then, of course, we're going to deploy our transgenic male mosquitoes. And in Piracicaba, they use a van and it looks something like this. transgenic mosquito mating with the wild type female, she's now out of the population because all of her offspring, they're going to have the self-limiting gene. They're going to be growing in a place in nature without tetracycline. They're going to die. So we watch this happen. Continue to release. The population goes down. Wild type males, transgenic, continue to go down, 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 down. Eradication. That is what we are going for. <laughs> okay, so what the oh, heck no, was going on there? That in a minute. Be ready to hit play, dude. <laughs> so uh, just to, just to get us up to date right there. So we have we have we have two different well several different approaches to actually use uh, exploit this one extraordinary phenomenon. Mosquitoes are monogamous. Male mosquitoes aren't. They're like, you, you'd expect, I mean, I should say that. So, so uh, <laughs> um, the, the, the technical word for behaviorists is monandrous, which means that, that, that uh, males can mate with as many as they can, but females only take one, and it is something that happens during copulation with the male, materials are transmitted in his fluids. He has, he has something called a male accessory gland that's a large chunk of his junk. Chunk of junk. Uh, can I say that? <laughs> uh, but in, anyway, uh, he, has, he has more glandular material than he has testes. And, and then this material basically, when transferred to a female during a copulation, will terminate her receptiveness for life to another male. So, she, so, so we can exploit that. And there's many ways to do it. One way was to early, or like mid 20th century, was to irradiate mosquitoes and then release these mosquitoes that were truly sterile. Their gametes would not function. And then now more modern techniques involve um, in, you know, creating a transgenic line of mosquitoes and raising them under conditions, there's a, there's a, a, a gene that's called a self-limiting gene that they've placed into Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, 
and they're doing this all around the world. And then um, if you can come up with a technique to just release the male mosquitoes that have that gene, as soon as they mate with females, all the offspring of that female are going to be still, they're dead. They, they will not, they will not uh, kind of, uh, um, it's that, that's it. And then that means that female, that's, the, oh, the other part about it, this is another fascinating thing. So in addition to the monogamy part, mosquitoes and just about all the insects that you're interested in have little sperm tanks. So actually when they are mated, they, they can be monogamous because they've got enough sperm for life. If they survive, they can continue to use that same little, little bit of sperm that's, that's inside of them. So anyway, fascinating biology. That's this one. This one is a transgenic approach and we have other approaches too. We should look at that one right now. Jody are teaming up with Verily to release Wolbachia males. So that word was Wolbachia. That's what I want you to remember. So we're here in Fancher Creek with Steve and Jody, and the Verily debug truck is on the way with a load of mosquitoes. But what I want to do is find out what in the world you're up to with Verily debug and male mosquitoes. It, it uh, sounds pretty crazy, kind of counterintuitive. We're releasing mosquitoes to control mosquitoes, but what we're releasing are male mosquitoes. And of course, male mosquitoes cannot bite, they cannot transmit disease, but they do mate. These mosquitoes, these male mosquitoes that we're releasing, have a bacterium called Wolbachia in them. The local population does not have the Wolbachia, so the okay. females don't have Wolbachia here. And when these males, go out and try to find females to mate with. They will mate with the local females, and because they have Wolbachia and the female does not, the eggs will be infertile. They will not hatch, and so you won't have the next generation. Only male mosquitoes. How are we gonna release them? You've seen this before. So, Verily is a subsidiary of Google. Verily debug Lots of truck money. in Fresno, California. And we're about ready to film a male release. And I've got a plan for this. I mean, these guys are going to come flying out of this van, and I need something really special to capture them. So, behold, here it is. <laughs> 20th century specialized macro optics and a little bit of 21st century camera gear. So. Let's see what we can do. Oh man! Look at him! Look at him! Look at him go! Oh! That's fantastic! Gosh! It's like a cannon! A mosquito cannon! Look at these guys! The truck comes, it launches its males periodically through time perhaps weekly, and therefore we will start to see Wolbachia showing up here. They don't live long, they mate with wild type females, and the whole idea here as we do this is that all of these matings right here, um, Wolbachia male, wild type female, these matings, as we've seen before, produce, before they can even hatch, eggs that are dead. CI, cytoplasmic incompatibility. Uh, bear in mind, during this particular time, we can also still have some of these existing, these existing wild types kind of do their thing, but eventually, if you overwhelm them, if you overwhelm them with males that have Wolbachia, you're going to be basically taking female after female after female after female out of the population, and this will result in... That's good right there. Consolidated mosquito control works the streets and tells everybody, hey, these are... Hey, yeah, that's good. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, yeah. So, Doc, this is an idea that we've seen around the world with a lot of interest in trying to control malaria and some other really like nasty mosquito-borne illnesses, but do you think this is something that can work here in Colorado with Culex mosquitoes? It's very, very expensive. 
Yeah. And Culex has a different kind of life cycle than the Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti, also Culex is a native species, so as far as taking out a native, that's not something a lot of people want to do necessarily. Whereas Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, it has been introduced all over the world. It's native to a small portion of Africa. Yeah. It's, it's not, not supposed to be in the Key West, Florida area. Uh, and so to, to take out a non-native species that shouldn't be there, that's carrying a lot of bad diseases, politically, that's not a bad thing to do. But it's very expensive to breed these mosquitoes in large numbers. With Aedes aegypti, you can do it because they're fairly easy to breed in captivity. It's still a challenge. Culex tarsalis is extremely difficult to breed in captivity. Mm -hmm. the, the expense wouldn't justify the, the means mm -hmm. necessarily. Mm -hmm. We don't have the, the capability to do that inexpensively today. Now, whether that will change in the future, again, I can't predict the future. Mass rearing is extraordinary. Just imagine blood feeding hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes. Uh, the, the, the factory in Brazil, they're using, they're using gallons of bovine blood every week just to feed their mosquitoes to get their transgenic eggs. And Bob, we should tell people, you, you have mosquitoes in your lab. Yeah. Um, how do you feed them? Stick them on in and uh, the, the, I've been feeding uh, all in. of my colonies. So, so, so I keep bed bugs and I keep, uh, I, I keep, uh, oh, that's fun, yeah. And then, and then, uh, and, then uh, and then mosquitoes of a variety of, uh, of types that will feed on me. There's only a, I, whenever I breed Culex mosquitoes, I actually have to use an automated feeding system because they don't like to feed on me. Well, I think we want to make time for audience questions here. So uh, I can see my good friend Lance back there will shuffle my microphone around and um, just raise your hand if you have a question. <coughs> I think we're there and there. I don't know mosquitoes, but um, <laughs> I do have a mask. That's good. Uh, my question is, saying how beautiful mosquitoes, some mosquitoes look under the microscope. Mm -hmm. But you're saying here we must eradicate all mosquitoes. So there's no positive ecological benefit of mosquitoes anywhere? No, that's not necessarily true. And we're not saying to eradicate all mosquitoes necessarily. Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking to control the population to reasonable levels. Now eradicating Aedes aegypti, which doesn't belong here, that's a different story. Sure, yeah. If we eradicate all mosquitoes, first of all, I'm not going to have a summer job. No. Uh, but, <laughs> but also, the expense of doing that is just, it's not feasible. Yeah, that's just, <clears throat> I'm, I'm hearing from this talk, if we eradicate all mosquitoes. Okay, yeah, okay. No. Yeah, don't, don't mean to give that impression. We, For uh, Aedes aegypti, yes, we okay. want to eradicate that. It doesn't belong in this country, and it's got some nasty, nasty human diseases. So eradicating that species isn't going to change the environment any. There's, there's no predator out there that's relying on that species. Most predators out there eat a lot of other things. Uh, so if they lose the mosquitoes, it'd be like losing the olives on your salad. You still have a salad, but okay, you give up the olives. Uh, so all the predators that go after mosquitoes will still have other things to eat. But again, we're not gonna eradicate all 54 species of mosquito here in Colorado. That's just not feasible. But we're we'll bringing the numbers down it's to not where. Desirable. Yeah, not desirable necessarily, but, but we're we'll bringing the numbers down, especially in the disease carrying mosquitoes, to levels where you're not going to have as many human deaths or human hospitalizations. That's the goal. I just have a question about irrigation. Uh, you talked about agricultural irrigation. Irrigation, uh, the community I live in, uh, people water their turf uh, ad infinitum, um, especially in these uh, retention ponds water kind of runs downhill and sits there in big ponds. Uh, what impact do you see on the population of mosquitoes as a result of that? Up, 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 up. Hold up. Yeah, up. <laughs> I mean, who decided that Kentucky bluegrass lawns were the most beautiful thing to have in your yard? I mean, we've got a pollinator garden in our yard full of flowers, full of butterflies, full of life. Um, and I, green's my favorite color, don't get me wrong. I love green, but it's monotonous if that's all you've got. And so this concept we have of landscape doesn't make a lot of sense, especially in the desert like the Denver area. We live in a short grass prairie, not a place where you would grow those lawns. So the amount of water we're using on these lawns is, is, is wild, but it's also creating the perfect conditions for mosquitoes. Not just the runoff ponds, but you get these microhabitats that are more humid. Grass lawns 
especially when they grow tall enough, are great places for mosquitoes to harbor because it's a, a small microclimate of higher humidity and cooler temperature. So they can live longer in those conditions. So yeah, it's great having these parks where the kids can play and stuff like that, but our own yards, it'd be mm -hmm. better if we had some diversity in there. Okay. I, re I remember when uh, West Nile first came out here in Colorado, places oh, like too. Costco were selling these uh, mosquito traps, you know, which would use like propane tanks uh -huh. and uh, just, uh, are there any effective sort of homeowner traps that people can use? Um, I was enthralled with the idea of like 35,000, like a stack of mosquitoes, you know, is there something <laughs> that people could have at their homes just to clear the air of these little guys? You know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. If you're sitting on the back porch, just run a fan. Mosquitoes are not strong flyers. You sit next to a fan and they're not going to be around you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the simplest thing. If you're going to be out and about, wear some deep. We, we put our seat belts on right when we get in the car, just automatic. We put sunscreen on when we go to the beach. The beach, it dried up 65 million <laughs> years ago, but when we used to go to the beach, we'd put sunscreen on. And, and, and yet, we don't do that with mosquito repellent. It's just as important. And so personal protection is by far the most effective way to keep from getting West Nile. But if you're sitting on the back porch, run a fan. So, so I, I'm a, a mosquito behaviorist. I, that, that's what I do is I study mosquito behavior. And I know for a fact that we've got the mosquito magnets coming out. I remember seeing the, the big mosquito magnet unit in one of our large local kind of um, um, sports super center stores. And um, they, th there, there were some studies that probably didn't even make it to press that I remember from, I was living in Kentucky in the time, and mosquito magnets were actually attracting mosquitoes to the backyards of the owners and operators of the equipment and helping the neighbors because the, the, the mosquitoes that were host seeking in the area at the time were all going to like my house with my trap. So they're getting, complicating the problem by attracting the other, the neighbor's mosquitoes and they're having a good time, so you know? The, the, the moral of the story is buy a mosquito magnet for the neighbor that you dislike the most. <laughs> uh, but also, if, if you're standing between the mosquito magnet and the source of the mosquitoes, they're gonna find you before they find the magnet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you wanna donate blood, that's one way to do it. I <laughs> prefer going to buy talent myself. Uh, my concern where the climate is concerned is given that the oceans are warming, and we had this atmospheric river from the North Pacific yeah. this last season. Uh, we do need to, I guess, keep an eye out that that may continue and be the new norm. So I'm just throwing that out there. At the moment, it's hard to tell, um, like we were talking about earlier, if this is a one-off kind of year or if this is going to be something that continues to get worse. So we're definitely monitoring that right now. But the last three years, 2020, 2021, 2022, we had below normal precipitation here in Denver area. So for three years before this, we had below normal. So again, weather and climate are two very different things. We do have to monitor it. We do have to watch the trends. And we have to be prepared for longer growing seasons, which also produces higher populations. We haven't had our first frost yet. We're waiting for it. We love it. But um, uh, yeah, mosquito <laughs> people love that first frost. So, so it's something we have to monitor, it's something we have to watch for. But right now, the biggest single item in our area is habitat change. Yeah, that, sure. That's the big, biggest single item, and that's happened already. That's already now. Lawns. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Lawns and fields. So ironically, as I was on my way to the light rail station this morning, I passed a, a large concrete re retainage pond thing with all the standing water in it. Yeah. And I was gonna say, you know, what can we do to kill the mosquitoes in there? And then I thought, well, maybe somebody's already done it. Um, is there an easy way for just an average Joe like myself to sample the water and look and tell if, if it has mosquitoes? What would I look for? Well, you look for, you, you familiarize yourself with mosquito larvae. They're all very, very similar in appearance. Um, Anopheles can throw a curve ball at you, but 
They're all, they, they, the, 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 the common name of a mosquito larva is wriggler. And that's a great word because, you know, what would, what do you guys, what kind of movement do you anticipate if I say wriggle? It's an yeah. S-shaped movement. Yeah. So these are, they, 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 their behavior is very, very easy to, to kind of identify. And there's not a lot of things that you would get mixed up with. There are some small larvae of other flies that do a similar thing. But mosquitoes are pretty easy to identify. And it's pretty easy to kill them in a very responsible way if you want to. Um, you can, the same material that Anna uses in control is available to homeowners uh, right off the shelf because it really is just a bacterial toxin that's very specific as Anna said. You can get little briquettes of this material and the briquette is just the carrier. So it's kind of a, a, a little a little unit of what are their briquettes made out of? Mosquito dunks they call them now. Yeah, yeah. but anyway they're little, little, little kind of uh, chunks, kind of like charcoals almost, that you can put into a body of water and you can get some pretty good you get immediate control, well, not immediate, but over the course of a couple of days, and it lasts for a good while, too. Um, we also have, uh, for example, if you're a Denver resident, um, we have a very close uh, relationship with Denver County Public Health. Um, we work closely with them to make sure that we're uh, getting to all of our larval sites and treating larvae in the water. Um, I believe you can contact them. I don't know if it's through their website or not off the top of my head, but you can contact them about areas you're concerned about to see if they've been treated as well. Also contacting VDCI directly, uh, all the sites are mapped that are treated. And so if that's not one of the mapped sites, uh, with Denver we have an interesting contract because we don't treat all of Denver. We treat specific areas that are owned by the city of Denver, but we don't treat on public land, on private lands rather, within the city of Denver. Um, so whether that's a treated site or not, that's something our our people could answer. I think it's actually in Aurora. Aurora, okay. Oh. Aurora does very little control. Yeah. There was some in in the, some of the parks and golf courses, but very little control. Mm -hmm. in, Can you do one more question, real quick. Just a note, a personal note, I lived on a Navy base when I was nine, ten years old, and two or three times a week, a Jeep went oh, around yeah. with DDT, oh, yeah. and we used to chase it and mm -hmm. s smell it. I mean, it's petroleum, I mean, but there was a sweet kind of smell to yeah. it, but my father did tell one of my sisters, don't do that, but I didn't get the message. We'd all just <laughs> run behind the DDT truck routinely. We did that with malathion when I was a kid. That's uh, not the first time I've heard that, actually. <laughs> yeah, we handled mercury. Yeah. And we're still here. Hey guys, you got another. Uh, yeah, I, th I think our, our panel time is up here, but I want to say thank you to our panelists um, for a really informational, really fun talk. Um, I also want to say thank you to all of you for coming to Sunfest. Yeah, it's you. a new kind of thing we're trying, That's and. Beautiful. Um, we're really excited to have this forum and uh, to talk about ideas for uh, building a better Colorado. So I just appreciate you being a part of that. And I also want to make sure I'm thanking our sponsors, uh, our presenting sponsor, XL Energy, and our institutional sponsor, uh, this campus, the Higher Education Center. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you.